What's up guys? Welcome to this week's video. So this week we're going to do something a little bit different than we've done before. Uh, it'll be similar style to the channel, but with a twist. I asked you guys to give me some questions that you would like to ask a blood or short tail keeper or breeder, and here they are answered from some of your favorite keepers in the hobby. Stay tuned. Hi, my name is Rich Crowley. Uh, I am the author of A Passion Journey with short tail Pythons. And Dan McGonnell presented a question for me to provide a response to. And the question was, uh, what type of activities or uh, uh, processes do I go through to cycle short tail Pythons? And it's a good question because I think it's uh, one that a lot of people rely on past uh, breedings with other species to kind of apply to short tail pythons, whether that's a blood python, a Borneo, or a Sumatran short tail. I think one of the key elements of that is having a good storm front coming in when you actually pair up uh, the animals that you're looking at breeding. Uh, I don't really go through any type of temperature variation. Uh, I do modify photo period only because I work with other species as well that are influenced by that. But my temperatures, as you you know, look over my shoulder, this room is kept at 78 and a half degrees Fahrenheit pretty much all year long with only a slight drop off of a couple degrees at nighttime. So it's pretty stable temperature wise. So temperature with short tails has not been an influence uh, from my perspective. Um, it's not to say that it can't uh, influence behaviors, but there's usually another uh, factor influencing and that's usually big changes in barometric pressure so for me often i look for a good storm front coming in and in the midwest that's uh we get some pretty dramatic weather uh, uh changes so that's a that's an easy one to apply um, whether that starts in september or goes all the way through until january there's usually some type of storm front that's affecting that's a great time to pair them up i leave them for a couple days until they don't show any more activity pull them out and you know whether um, taking care of them through a shed cycle and soaking them or, uh, or giving them an extra soak because it is dry in the Midwest. Uh, I also will um, try to focus on only one pairing. Uh, so that means the male and female are only um, placed with each other. They're not placed with other animals. Uh, I find that when you introduce a male to more than one female, you don't, tip, don't really typically get the same results. So that's a big focus. Um, on my breeding programs is they're usually fairly selective. So I'm looking for that specific pairing and trying to make sure that everything, um, that, that the male and female actually have enough presence with each other to influence the necessary uh, egg development within the female. The hormones play a big part of this. So just keep pairing them up until they stop losing interest. Um, that might take a couple of months uh, and it varies. Uh, first time breeders sometimes need a little extra help. So folks, uh, keep it simple. Uh, look for those weather patterns uh, and you know, make sure that um, the animals are healthy and have good weight before you pair them up because if either the male or the female is not in optimum shape, they will not breed successfully. You'll either get slugs or you'll get other um, health issues that will result uh, from the animals. And that could include egg binding on the females. And make sure weight is good. You don't want too fatty. Uh, and you certainly don't want anorexic. So uh, definitely make sure that you know you got good feeding and good body weight before you do it. Hey, I'm Matt from Philly Hair Pediculture. I'm helping out my friend Dan by answering a question someone had for him. I believe the question is, is your collection always increasing as a breeder because you're always holding back animals from clutches. 
That all depends on your goals and what you want to achieve as a breeder. It also depends on what species you're keeping, if there's mutations involved, and everything in between. Uh, someone like myself, I tend to hold back a lot. A lot of people say I hold back too much, and I do got to learn how to come off some animals because my goals are to make unbelievable, mind-blowing animals that I want to keep for, first before anyone else. And I do enjoy supplying the hobby with awesome animals too that people seem to like and enjoy. But the first thing on my mind is always making things for myself, to be honest. And that's always where I stood and that's how it went. I don't really enjoy selling snakes, but it does have its benefits because you get to upgrade equipment like cages, racks, thermostats, and also buy new animals to add to your breeding projects. When it comes to mutations, you're also you're going to usually hold back a lot more because you're trying to hit a goal of a certain combination or achieve the actual visual look. And if you're if you're breeding animals that are pretty much just a wild type thing, depending on the rarity, you might hold back an entire clutch to have more animals in your collection so you can learn more about the animals and, and learn about breeding them better, raising them as babies and, and everything in between. So really it's an individual thing. You don't have to hold back animals. You don't have to hold back a ton of animals. It also sort of depends on your space and your time and how much you want to put into all your projects. So it's not your fate that you're always going to increase and you can always decide to come off animals later on down the line, but it's always nice to have the option to keep animals back so you have the best of the best or you have good numbers to in, to increase your projects. I hope that answered the question. I hope I didn't stutter through that too much because I hate making videos. See ya. So the question that I'm going to answer for this series is someone asked, why are Sumatran short-tail pythons and Borneo short-tail pythons not more popular? Uh, and so I think first and foremost, it's because people are ridiculous and foolish because they are both awesome, awesome species of snakes that have a lot to offer. Uh, first of all, let's forget what they look like at all. Personality-wise, incredible animals. Uh, the bloods and short-tails in general uh, intelligent snakes, fun to work with, interactive. Uh, they seem to be really personable, especially once you establish them, have them comfortable. They feel good with you. Uh, you get as much as you give with them and sometimes more. Uh, so I don't know why uh, more people don't get into them. Uh, I think it's the initial jump. Most people that get into them, if they, if they do the research and, and go at it the right way, really enjoy keeping them. I know when I sell, snakes, uh, short tails specifically, uh, rarely do I sell one and be done. Almost always people come back for more or I see them buying more from somebody else because somebody has something more in line with what they're looking for for something else. Um, but I think that the reason why they are not more popular is simply put, uh, you know, the ball python craze, why ball pythons got so popular was not only because of their small size, which obviously bloods and short tails need larger caging, uh, so that, that takes them down a, a little bit from there, but it's the morphs. Everybody got so obsessed with the next big thing. Um, and, and you look at it, you know, the um, ball pythons in general are popular, but are pastels really popular? Are spiders really popular anymore? They're popular in combinations, but those individuals that were crazy popular once upon a time have come way down. And so for bloods and short tails, and short tails specifically for this question, um, you know, with the Sumatrans, you really have one morph. Uh, you have some locality, you know, color phases and things like that with the orange heads and with the, um, the chrome heads and the darker stuff that's line bred. But basically you have that, the caramel albino or the T positive albino that's in the, uh, the orange head locality. Uh, and that's about it. And, uh, they are cool looking snakes, but I don't think they're mind blowing to the point where, um, you know, they're really high demand. And then with Borneos, I think the biggest reason why they're not more popular is the difficulty in understanding how the genetics work. Um, it's really hard to sell somebody on a project they don't understand. 
especially when you tell them like, hey, you can pair these two animals up, but that doesn't mean you're gonna get what you desire. Um, or I can't tell you what every single offspring is. It's not like, well, this one is a pastel, this one's a spider, this one's a Mojave. You don't have that. So with Borneos, a lot of times when you're we're saying what a baby is, you say what the pairing is. And so I think that puts a lot of people off. They also don't photograph particularly well, um, which does matter ultimately. Um, you know, photos are either eye-catching or they're not. And so if you're not really into a species, uh, then you'll probably just pass them by. Uh, I do think their popularity is growing. Uh, Blood Python popularity has been skyrocketing uh, pretty steady for the last several years. Um, I think, you know, content like this helps. I think people just keeping more and us keeping better and the animals settling better into captivity helps. So I think you'll continue to see the Sumatrans and the Borneos grow, but uh, people definitely need to get on board with them. Awesome snakes, as you know, I love them. Check out the next one. How's it going everyone? My name is Rob. I work at New England Reptile Distributors. I've been keeping and breeding Bloods and Short Tails for about 13 years now. They've been one of my main passions since I was really young. you got a little short tail in there. Um, but today I'm going to be showing you some tricks and tips on getting baby Bloods and Short Tails to eat. Okay, one of the important things is your setup for your blood or short tail. When they're young, they're very prone to feeling vulnerable, so they don't want to be in a giant enclosure. Um, this is from a V6 rack, and this is like their long baby drawer. I like these a lot. I use them for my short tail babies this year. They came out pretty good. Uh, I put some crumpled paper in there. I usually use paper as a base and then a good sized water dish uh, to keep them feeling secure. So, whenever I'm feeding Bloods and Short Tails, I like to feed them dead. So, I got a little pre-killed rat here. I like to give them something about as big as the thickest part of their body. And then, generally, some of them you might have to harass a little bit to get them to actually take it. This one's very defensive. There we go. And you get the wrap. Once you get the wrap, you just want to kind of leave them alone, and they'll do the rest. Hi guys, Dylan Hayne, CBT Exotics here. Uh, I'm just here to talk to you guys about what to look for in Matrix besides a pink tongue. So it's a super variable gene to begin with. Um, so you're gonna have lots of different looks. I got a couple snakes down here. Um, but uh, basic things to look for in a Matrix besides a pink tongue is classic pattern. Generally, it's sad to say, uh, Matrix don't have as nice of color unless you've line bred or have an animal from a line breeding to get color kind of into there they just seem kind of washed out so here you see a animal i call a white wall matrix this is from my mega line um so one thing you can look for is this distorted pattern pixelation this is a really extreme example of that it's kind of hard to get a good picture a good video but you see kind of like what you would expect uh in the movie the matrix if you've seen it um, those little pixels are flying across the screen. You see a lot of that here. Um, pattern has a lot to do with it here as well. Um, this animal doesn't have a lot of your classic matrix pattern. But another quick thing to look for besides that pink tongue that has to do with the face is a very wide postocular stripe. So you see that there right behind the eye, that white stripe. Very thick, very bold, very noticeable. That seems to be a common correlation with matrix as well. I'll show you a non-matrix animal. This is a much younger animal um, that I produced this year. This is a Karma. But so if you look at her eye stripe, ah, got me an elbow. Very thin, not very pronounced compared to the other one. Um, and you get a more classic blood look to it. Um, and then we have a more extreme matrix. This is from also 
for my make, uh, Mega Matrix line that that last girl I was showing you is from. Um, you also get that very distorted pattern, super pixelated. This is your more traditional Matrix. You get a lot of striping with Matrix, a lot of weird cactusy looking stuff. By, what I mean by cactusing is you'll get the striping, but you'll get little arms coming off it to look like a cactus. Um, but then once again, very wide, very pronounced eye stripe. Uh, also not a very red animal per se. Um, and this is also not a matrix. This is another Karma, a bit older. Um, now a lot of people may look at this pattern and think matrix. Uh, this is most likely from a matrix breeding, so you might have pattern along with that. But you notice the color, that's also because of Karma. But that eye stripe. isn't very thick not very pronounced she's not cooperating very well I don't want to grab her head and stress her out especially with these three down on my but you can see there not very heavy not very heavy um, then we'll show you one more matrix uh, actually a girl gave me a clutch this year she's a little more traditional matrix She's still kind of coming back from laying eggs, but she's a good looking matrix. So this has the pixelation as well, but not heavily as black as you would see with other stuff. She has more of that single color on a scale, um, white pixelation than anything, as you can see, very clean belly. Um, it's also an indicator with matrix. Very clean bellies. Clean belly. Get bit all over here. This belly, a little more pigment to it, but the karma kind of really drowns out the color as well. But this is that matrix I wanted to show you now that we got back to her. Pretty pronounced eye stripe there, especially at the base. Very pixelated pattern. And then she has that classic matrixy, stripey look to her. Now, not all of them will be stripey like that, and like I said, some will be kind of cactusy looking. Um, but that also seems to really be pronounced when you add head albino in there. Not sure why, but those are just a few things you can look at to kind of pinpoint out a matrix when you're not looking for that pink tongue. But, your safe bet, if you don't know what you're looking at, that pink tongue is a surefire go-to. But, for you guys that are aiming to breed, if you breed a matrix to a normal, then you get to the point where you're hatching the babies, comparing them side by side is like night and day. You'll be able to pick out the matrix, and then all those things I just told you about, um, you can kind of compare to other babies and get an idea of what's matrix. But that pink tongue gear sure far away. All right. Thanks guys.